a couple of you asked me, who's that weird kid that gets on the stage with you sometimes? Uh, that's, that's, that's Cody. That yeah, that's Cody. And uh, one of the things we talk about at our church is we're trying to be a church that uh, are full of disciples that make disciples. And we are a church plant that wants to plant more churches. And so for those of you that are new, Cody is actually our resident church planter. He's working with us for two years. And then the idea is we're going to send him out to plant a church where God leads him to plant, him and his wife. So if you don't know Cody, that's who Cody is, and I'm Eric. And uh, we are really excited that we have one more Sunday after this, and then we're going to be in our new location. And can I just ask you on the front end of that, are you praying about that? Um, it's occurred to me that as we're getting ready to move into a public school, that if the schools were to get really locked down over the COVID thing again, uh, we could find ourselves homeless again. So this will be our... Um, I was going through the other day with George. I think that'll be our fifth or sixth location um, in a year. And most of that's been COVID related. Um, these are great problems to have. And we want to just thank you guys for being so flexible, uh, so supportive. And I think we're going to have an awesome time at the school, uh, Lord willing. So uh, today we're starting a new series called The Kingdom Gospel. And I was, I was reading this thing. I, I, I don't know about you guys. I like to read. I like to listen to podcasts. And I actually heard this podcast and then I read an article about it about something called uh, the Forest Fen Treasure. Anybody heard of that besides me? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. Great, thank you. These people know how to read also besides me, so those are our scholars. Um, if you've ever dreamed of finding like hidden treasure, um, you probably have at least crossed your mind. If you ever thought of like, you know, the uh, Treasure Island or Pirates of the Caribbean, there's there's lost gold, there's these hidden treasures. And, and you know, for, for the, the history of the human race, I think people have fantasized about finding the mother load, you know. Well, in 2010, there was an eccentric art dealer in New Mexico named Forrest Fenn, and he decided, he thought he was dying, and he decided that he wanted to fill a treasure chest full of, uh, like, the gold and jewels, and that's actually the treasure chest right there, and he buried that somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, and then he kind of announced to the world that there's a treasure out there, and the idea was that you had to go and buy his book, his self-published book, and there's a poem in the book, and if you could decode the poem, like everything you needed to solve the mystery was in the poem, then you might be able to find the treasure. Well, just like our room today, most people hadn't heard of it, and several years went by as people were, were kind of going and looking for this treasure, and then one morning he got invited to appear on like Good Morning America or something like that, and then the word got out, and people started going crazy looking for this treasure. It kind of created a bit of a like a cult-like following of these would-be treasure hunters who became obsessed with finding this treasure that was ended up being about $2 million worth of goods, okay? So message boards popped up, and people would, like, propose theories and, and kind of troubleshoot together, and they, of course, argue for their understanding or their view. And, and, of course, some people immediately said, I found it. You know, there's always people like that. Many people thought it was a hoax, like it wasn't real. Um, some people literally went bankrupt looking for this treasure. Uh, some people quit their jobs. Some people spent weeks and weeks and months and months over the course of like a decade looking for this treasure. Numerous people were arrested for trespassing. Like people were like digging up other people's yards, like looking for this treasure. Um, there was private property damage. There was public property damage in some of the national parks like Yellowstone. Tragically, Five people died looking for this box of buried treasure. One of them was a pastor. He should have known better. The appeal of this hidden treasure, the appeal of this hidden treasure was so great that people were literally willing to lose everything to find it. And that sounds kind of crazy, right? I mean, I've seen some of your facial expressions going, well, these people are crazy. But that's exactly how Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. That's how Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. He said, God's kingdom is the greatest treasure there is. And I want to actually show you the words in Matthew 13 where he tells a parable. A parable is a little story, a story to make a point. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement... And as Jesus says in Luke, Luke's gospel, chapter 19, verse 23, we've said this before here at the church, anyone who wants to follow me must first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Those words basically say that you cannot have the kingdom without the king. 
In John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus' disciple Thomas, uh, nicknamed the twin, not nicknamed the doubter, by the way, uh, Jesus' disciple Thomas asked him uh, how he could know the way to the Father's home. How could I know the way to the Father's home? Jesus is talking about, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And Thomas says, well, how can we know how to get there? And Jesus' response is so crystal clear. And as a church, I just ask that we hear this this morning. John 14, chapter 6, it says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the King. In fact, when Martha's brother Lazarus was lying dead in his tomb, Martha had faith in Jesus to raise him from the dead, and their interaction in that moment kind of gave us a little bit of a glimpse into Jesus as this kingdom king. John chapter 11, 25 through 26, Jesus tells her, uh, or Jesus tells Martha this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after they die. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. The apostles also remind us in Acts 4 that Jesus is the king. When they're talking about Jesus, uh, they say these words concerning salvation. Acts chapter 4, 12, it says this, that there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The kingdom of God is where Jesus rules and reigns. And so if we're going to ask God to send his kingdom among us, then I think this morning we have to come to grips with the truth that we cannot ask God to send his kingdom if we don't first ask him to send his king. We can't have the kingdom without the king. And to be clear, the king's name's not Cody. It's not Eric. It's not social justice. It's not Biden. It's not Trump. But the king's name is Jesus Christ. And it's at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Here's the deal. Many of us in this room have acknowledged that Jesus Christ is our king. But there is a day that is coming soon where even those who have not acknowledged Christ, who have actually done the opposite, they've walked away from Christ, they're still going to bow to him. So the question this morning is not whether or not Jesus is the king. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is the king. The only question that we have to answer this morning is, is Jesus Christ your king? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that all this kind of comes down to authority. Um, we want all the blessings of God. We just don't want God. We want to have this utopian society where we're convinced ourselves we can we can make it happen if we just believe and work hard and we can make it happen without the authority. We want what Jesus says, but we just don't want Jesus. We started talking about the Forest Fen treasure and it was finally discovered in 2020, just last year, by a man named Jack Stoof. And uh, after 10 years of searching, it was all over and you can see the guy on the screen. Um, and the response of the public was just hilarious. Some said, again, it was all a hoax. Some said it, he didn't find it. I found it. Uh, some said they didn't really believe it was found. And there are currently people still out looking <laughs> for the treasure, even though the guy who found it took a picture of himself with the box, with the guy who hid it, together, confirming that, yes, this was the treasure. One lady actually filed a lawsuit against this guy, <laughs> saying that he had hacked her computer and stolen her solve. And so uh, that's the only reason we know his name, by the way. He was going to stay completely hidden, um, but the lawsuit forced him to become, uh, come out into the public. What, none of that stuff the public did surprise me. What surprised me was that this man, Jack, the finder of this treasure, that he refused to share anything about what he found. He won't reveal the location where he found it. He won't reveal how he solved the puzzle. He won't even discuss what clues he unlocked. He won't do interviews with TV or magazines. He arguably solved the greatest treasure hunt in American history, modern American history, and he's happy to keep it all to himself. And I, I thought, you know, I think that's how it goes with the kingdom. There are a lot of people that have a citizenship in God's kingdom because of Jesus, 
and they're happy to keep it all to themselves. And yet the good news was to be preached. The good news was to be proclaimed. The good news was to be announced. The good news was to be shared with the nations. And so next week, that's what we're going to talk about, is about the idea of sharing uh, the gospel. And we're going to actually teach you a simple way of how to share the gospel next Sunday morning. And so I hope you'll come back and hear that. If you've got those people you've been working on for a while, drag them in next week because we're going to give out the gospel next Sunday and I'd love for them to have a chance to hear it. All right, we're going to transition into our time of communion. And so if you did not get communion this morning, you should have all received one. If you didn't get communion, would you just pop your hand up? We'll have someone bring you communion. Y'all got it? Cody's going to do a little stage change for me here. Nice talk. <laughs> um, we did have a, we had a little bit of our old communion this morning and a little bit of our new communion. So if you got the new communion, you are blessed. <laughs> if you have the old one, we're almost out of it. We'll be all into the new stuff next week, okay? Um, so we're going to do what we always do on Sunday. Take time to pray. We use the Lord's Prayer, and sometimes we, we just call it the look prayer. And we do that because it's a simple memory device, something we can teach our kids, our grandkids, something we can teach someone who's a new believer in Jesus. Uh, we take the words of the Lord's Prayer and then we say, like, look up, look ahead, look down, look in, look around, and look out. Just kind of ways to remember the Lord's Prayer. So when you hear that language, don't be confused. You don't have to actually look. <laughs> it's a metaphor, okay? Roll with it. Um, so let's go ahead and bow our heads. And we're going to begin with the looking up part. Jesus said, uh, our Father who lives in heaven, may your name be kept holy. That's praise. Praising God. Thanking God. So why don't we take a few moments right now and just praise God for being our good Father, for sending His Son, for all the good things our God's done for us. Praise Him. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus actually said to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He's praying, he say, pray for the kingdom to come in its fullness. So that's what we're going to pray for. We're going to ask that the kingdom of God would keep advancing, that more and more people would hear the good news and be saved. And we can even pray at this time that, that Jesus would come back. down is the words we use to remind us of when Jesus said to uh, give us this day our daily bread. It's praying for our needs. What do you need? What are the needs of people you know right now and what they're, they're needing God to do for them? So pray for yourself. Pray for others. Tell God what you need. prayer Jesus said forgive us our sins that's our chance to look in every week and examine ourselves examine our hearts and confess any sin that we need to get off our chest remember we're not informing God of anything he doesn't already know we're just admitting to God what he already does know and so if you've sinned just confess it tell God what you've done ask him to give you strength ask God to forgive our sins, but Jesus in that prayer, he said forgive those who sin against you. And so if there's someone that you're holding a grudge against, if there's someone you've not forgiven, 
if there's someone that has sinned against you, but they just don't know Jesus, they don't know any better yet, pray for those people. Pray that you'll forgive the people that sinned against you and, and pray that they'll come to know Jesus as their Savior too. Lastly, we remember to look out. It's that thing Jesus said, where he said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, you know, church, we are, uh, we are in a battle, whether we have eyes to see it or not. There are spiritual forces in the heavenly realms that are, that are waging war over the hearts and souls of people like us, the people we love. There is an enemy, and he is real, and he is plotting against us. He doesn't want us to be followers of Jesus. He doesn't want this church to take off. He doesn't want more churches planted, more disciples made. He doesn't want any of that. And so Jesus said to pray against that. <coughs> we'd be delivered from the evil one. So let's pray that now. Father, we're so thankful for the people that you've sent here today and for a chance to talk about the kingdom of heaven. Father, we know that we are part of the kingdom now and we will inherit the kingdom when it comes in its fullness. And none of that is because of what we have done, but only because of what Christ has done. And so we want to pause this morning and remember Jesus and what he did for us. And we want to do it the way that he asked us to. He said to take bread in remembrance of him. And so I'm going to invite you to open up your cups and take that bread out. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he held up that bread and he said, this is my body. Uh, eat it in remembrance of me. And so let's take that bread together now, remembering that the body of Jesus, the one who's called the bread of life, the body of Jesus was nailed to the cross for our sins. And next he took a cup of wine and he said, this is my blood. It's symbolic of his blood that was shed on the cross. And he said to drink that, that wine in remembrance of him. And so if you've got your cup ready, let's go ahead and, and drink that in remembrance of Jesus. Father, there are no words to say to express how we feel about the sacrifice and suffering of Jesus on our behalf. We know that we're not worthy of it. We know that we can't earn it. We know that we can't even live up to the name of Jesus and the standards of Jesus, but we can say humbly this morning, thank you for Jesus and what he's done for us. Thank you for accepting us into your family, into your kingdom. And Father, as we prepare to enter a new week today where we work and play and live alongside many people that don't know about Jesus, when I pray, Lord, that when they see us, that they would get a glimpse of your kingdom. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. All right. Hey, we're going to stand up and sing one more song as we close out. And I want to remind you on the way out this morning, we do have an offering box in the back. Thank you for doing that. If you want to give online, that's actually even better for us. Um, but thank you for your support of the church. Let's go ahead and stand up and sing.
Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 23. We've said this before here at the church. Anyone who wants to follow me must first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Those words basically say that you cannot have the kingdom without the king. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus' disciple Thomas uh, nicknamed the twin, not nicknamed the doubter, by the way. Uh, Jesus' disciple Thomas asked him uh, how he could know the way to the Father's home. How could I know the way to the Father's home? Jesus is talking about, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And Thomas says, well, how can we know how to get there? And Jesus' response is so crystal clear. And as a church, I just ask that we hear this this morning. John 14, chapter 6, it says this, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the King. In fact, when Martha's brother Lazarus was lying dead in his tomb, Martha had faith in Jesus to raise him from the dead, and their interaction in that moment kind of gave us a little bit of a glimpse into Jesus as this kingdom king. John chapter 11, 25 through 26, Jesus tells her, uh, or Jesus tells Martha this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after they die. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. The apostles also remind us in Acts 4 that Jesus is the king. When they're talking about Jesus, uh, they say these words concerning salvation. Acts chapter 4, 12, it says this, that there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The kingdom of God is where Jesus rules and reigns. And so if we're going to ask God to send his kingdom among us, then I think this morning we have to come to grips with the truth that we cannot ask God to send his kingdom if we don't first ask him to send his king. We can't have the kingdom without the king. And to be clear, the king's name's not Cody. It's not Eric. It's not social justice. It's not Biden. It's not Trump. But the king's name is Jesus Christ. And it's at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's the deal. Many of us in this room have acknowledged that Jesus Christ is our king. But there is a day that is coming soon where even those who have not acknowledged Christ, who have actually done the opposite, they've walked away from Christ, they're still going to bow to him. So the question this morning is not whether or not Jesus is the king. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is the king. The only question that we have to answer this morning is, is, is Jesus Christ your king? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that all this kind of comes down to authority. Um, we want all the blessings of God. We just don't want God. We want to have this utopian society where we're convinced ourselves we can, we can make it happen if we just believe and work hard. And we can make it happen without the authority. We want what Jesus says, but we just don't want Jesus. We started talking about the Forest Fen treasure, and it was finally discovered in 2020, just last year, by a man named Jack Stoof. And uh, after 10 years of searching, it was all over, and you can see the guy on the screen. Um, and the response of the public was just hilarious. Some said, again, it was all a hoax. Some said it, what, he didn't find it. I found it. Uh, some said they didn't really believe it was found, and there are currently people still out looking <laughs> for the treasure, even though the guy who found it took a picture of himself with the box, with the guy who hid it, together, confirming that, yes, this was the treasure. One lady actually filed a lawsuit against this guy, <laughs> saying that he had hacked her computer and stolen her solve. And so uh, that's the only reason we know his name, by the way. He was going to stay completely hidden. Um, but the lawsuit forced him to become, uh, come out into the public. What, none of that stuff the public did surprise me. What surprised me was that this man, Jack, the finder of this treasure, that he refused to share anything about what he found. He won't reveal the location where he found it. He won't reveal how he solved the puzzle. He won't even discuss what clues he unlocked. 
He won't do interviews with TV or magazines. He arguably solved the greatest treasure hunt in American history, modern American history, and he's happy to keep it all to himself. And I, I thought, you know, I think that's how it goes with the kingdom. There are a lot of people that have a citizenship in God's kingdom because of Jesus, and they're happy to keep it all to themselves. And yet the good news was to be preached. The good news was to be proclaimed. The good news was to be announced. The good news was to be shared with the nations. And so next week, that's what we're going to talk about, is about the idea of sharing uh, the gospel. And we're going to actually teach you a simple way of how to share the gospel next Sunday morning. And so I hope you'll come back and hear that. If you've got those people you've been working on for a while, drag them in next week. <laughs>